Welcome to the Virtualization in Cloud Security video podcast, episode number five, six, seven, something like that, and episode number 150-something for the generic video, um, Virtualization Security Roundtable podcast. We've moved to a video format. I'd like to welcome Mike Foley from VMware Technical Marketing, where he's in charge of vSphere Security, which is so much fun. Oh, yeah. And Tom Howard's a fellow analyst at the virtualization practice who does more network virtualization and storage virtualization and things like that, who is played a lawyer in a, a previous life. You could say that. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Anyways, today I want to talk about something different. Actually, it comes from a Twitter conversation. I'm probably be writing about this um, in the future as well, and that is, is that how do you scale up security to meet current um, requirements? Let me give you a little baseline what I'm talking about. When I was doing physical security, I may have had a thousand physical machines. I had all my tools in line to harden those machines, to harden the network and so forth. And then I introduced virtualization. Now those physical machines went down to hundreds, not thousands. But I added in these, this virtual machine layer that added thousands of virtual machines, let's say three, four, five, even 10,000. And now we're adding in another substrate called containers. And containers are going to be micro, contain microservices, and they're going to be in the scales of tens to twenties to fifties to hundreds of thousands of containers. So the whole question becomes, how do you handle that level of scale in a security world that's really wrapped around compliance instead of actually securing the infrastructure. That's what I want to talk about. In blank spares. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked. Let them have containers. Don't let them have containers. Oh, that's not going to happen. They already so do. I, I guess. I Put guess the no back into secure into innovation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess no. the. Um... I guess the real issue here is um, when are security vendors and security professionals going to get ahead or at least at parity with the game rather than coming in one, two, three, seven years later and trying to figure out, okay, now how, now that it's all in place and in production, now how do I secure it? Well, virtualization, that's what happened with virtualization. I'm yep. hoping that doesn't happen with containers. But if it does, we're, I mean, security is going to get once more be behind the eight ball. Now, we've actually suggested on this podcast that security embed folks in the development teams. And I still believe that's part of the solution. We're not going to expect developers to become security guys overnight. Matter of fact, most of them just don't have the right mindset to do that. And they're not going to. I can train them to or, be secure. Or they have gold on it. It's right. It's right. Their, their, their monetary compensation has nothing to do with being secure. It has everything to do with producing product faster. Mm -hmm. So the business says, I want product A. The developer says, that'll take four months. Business comes back and says, I want it yesterday. That's quite And then the response is, okay, six months. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> And then they do an agile sprint and it's done within one day or one week or whatever it takes to do it. They do continuous integration, continuous deployment. Security was necessarily, not necessarily involved because it's not a compliance issue. So which company are you talking about who's doing these agile sprints? Um, a lot of them are. <laughs> Most of the ones I'm still working with are very, very waterfall. Um, the companies I work with are doing agile. It's, it's six of these half dozen another. It's about producing product faster and faster and faster. Mm, unless you work for an SI when it's more about change control, change control, change control. Well, also an SI is all about how much more can I add in to make more money? Or rather how much more I can not add in to make more money. Exactly. But let's think about this way. If I have 10,000 containers with... 10,000 different versions of OpenSSL, for example, embedded oh in those containers. How are you going to manage that? Oh, my God. Well, think about it. It can happen. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Easily, I mean, more, more easily than most people realize. Yeah, a lot I mean, more easier I, I, than with virtualization. It, much easier than with virtualization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we get we get OpenSSL with just that one library. If you go into probably every VM out there, virtual machine, there's a huge amount of drift. Yes. And how do you solve that problem today? You need tools. Well, you need automation. You need tools that do automation that know to look for OpenSSL. Now, a bunch of companies have solved that. They actually look at the CVEs, and because they're looking at the CVEs, they can actually scan the machines for vulnerabilities, and they actually do intrusive scanning to look at library versions and say, hey, you got the wrong version of OpenSSL. I can trigger you on that. But those tools have not grown to be for containers yet. There is one um, company called Twistlock worth looking at that does for containers. Yeah, I think that I think this you're I think you're talking about a very rapidly growing market, not to provide containers, but to provide the services to manage the containers and secure the containers. Exactly. And I think that is going to be within the next year a huge huge market bigger than what it is right now oh I, I would agree and there's a lot of companies on the ground floor of this and there's a lot of like qualis is starting to look at containers doing their scans against containers as well but if you have that much drift on open ssl i mean it's a nightmare yeah and there's no way a, a human can do it within 10 years and you're only talking one library there right a crucial one but yes you know, if I have a, a glibc or a libc or a, a a C++ or a Java problem, it's, the drift is probably going to be even more. Even though the whole thing about continuous integration, continuous deployment is basically to say, hey, take the container, drop it, and re replace it with a new one. That's the ideal way, and that new one has all the right levels of everything. But the ideal is not being seen today. We're talking about containers that have full operating systems in them. Oh. Why? Oh. Because they don't understand what a container is. Exactly. Right. You know, I don't want that. I want my virtual machine to have a full operating system. I want the container to contain just the bits I need to make that microservice run. Right. And that's it's... usually just libraries. It's analogous to when application virtualization came out in the Windows world. People put every single thing in their dog into the application virtualization bubble because they mm -hmm. didn't understand what to do. And eventually they understood that they don't need to have .NET in their application virtualization bubble because it's already on the, on the underlying host. Exactly. Right. Unless you need a specific version of it. That's not unless on you need a, Unless you need a specific version. And if you need a specific version, your code's probably broken anyways for and, and has a serious number of security vulnerabilities. Unless it's above a newer version than what's actually installed in your corporate environment, which is usually the case, to be honest. Actually, usually it's an older version, like to support IE6. Yeah. Don't swear at me. <laughs> <laughs> but those are, I mean, when you start talking about containers, it's really app virtual application virtualization done differently. Well, hey, everything's okay now because we've got Edge. Edge? Microsoft's new browser in Windows 10. Edge. <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't even seen it yet. It's um, so far on the edge, nothing really works with it yet. <laughs> something optimal for being at, being containerized. But when we start talking about the scale of security, and this goes for anything, we need the tools built into not production. They should be there, but that's not right. where it starts. It really starts with, I mean, my, my whole thing is I've, I work with customers today that deal with, you know, how do they get developers to develop securely and so forth. And there's always this big argument about, you know, what access levels they should have. And to me, if I'm developing something for production, I measure 12 inches to the foot, which means that a developer has exactly the access 
they would get in production, which is not really a whole lot of access at all. Once they deploy their container or their virtual machine as if it was production, development understands the constraints they're now under. Just because you need root access, you can, you can request root access, doesn't mean you should have it, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I run into situations where customers are using tools that were not designed in the way that they're using them, but, well, that's the way we do it now. You know, they're, they're giving their developers console access to a virtual machine that could just as easily be RDP'd into and then turning around and saying, well, it doesn't work like RDP. No kidding. No way. It, it, oh, yeah. And there's no. a limited number of console accesses you can give anyway, so why bother? It, it, why would you even give anybody console access to anything? But exactly. people think they need it to mount CD-ROMs and other things and install software, and it's like, no, I can do that using a whole bunch of other tools, and no, you don't need it. Yeah. So my, my question was, why are we trying to solve the customer's perceived issue, and why not turn around and suggest an alternative method? And that kind of blows into this whole thing around containers is my fear is that, and, and we, and you touched on it with this package, everything we possibly yeah. could eat into the container is we can present all these really cool concepts and tools and everything else. But if your mentality is every, everything is a hammer. <laughs> when you need a screwdriver, it doesn't you. work. Yeah. Right, I can't. I can't help you secure your environment if you're bundling in every library and then saying, "Okay, we can't touch this ever, ever, ever again," because yeah. the world changes around you. Oh, well, that's okay, just wrong. So now too. I've got to completely rip apart the container just to update a single library. Well, that's where I think some of the tools that, if you look at like continuous integration, continuous deployment. I mean, I wrote about this actually in the last white paper we just put out. I did a, um, I was writing about security and, and scale testing using Breaking Point VE from Exia, but I was talking about scale and security testing and how you pull that into a, conti a continuous integration, continuous deployment environment. And what it really boils down to is, is that you have code, you have infrastructure as code, in other words, the inventory and bits to create the container, but you really need a security as code that does more than just, hey, let's put, let's update the infrastructure to have the latest version of OpenSSL and this, this bit of hardening and this bit of configuration. The security as code needs to actually do more than that. It needs to, as you go through your life cycle of, develop, test, QA, production, and test and QA tend to get merged together in, in these environments. Your Jenkins, Vagrant, whatever server you're using, Ansible, whatever server you're using, even a Puppet one, for example, you need to be able to have security as code that as part of deployment gets run to verify the simplest of things. Let's say cross-site scripting starts somewhere. Well, the thing is, you only have all, all you've been talking about at the minute is a tenth of the environment, that enterprise environment. We still, you know, it's all right saying yes, we can do this with Puppet, Chef, Ansible, but you're talking the Linux world, open source. You can do this actually with Windows as well. Jenkins and everything else still works on Windows. But that's a whole paradigm shift because that is open source people are probably a little bit more open to change than Windows people. I would agree, but they still don't have secure coders. And because they don't have secure coders, security still needs to move up and step up by providing the tools and the integrations at those levels. And, and not, I, not, only, not only the tools and integrations, but the, the thought process. So the, yeah, the, 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 the sitting in a sitting in a meeting, 
and seeing an engineer turning around and saying, and this is how I plan that this piece of functionality will work. And the security guy being there, being able to go, yeah, but what if the customer uses it in this fashion? What do you do? Security, the developer's like, well, I never thought of that. Well, that's because you don't have the security mind, the security hat on, right? And it, it's, it's just getting the security guy's opinion on some things that may that the, the developer would then be informed enough to be able to go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't do it that way. Let me try it this way. And then everyone goes, yeah, okay, that will work better. The, the, it, the customer won't be using the, uh, the wrench as a hammer. Well, and unfortunately, I have a feeling that a lot of people that are in those meetings where if the security guy brought up something like that, the developer would just, the engineer would just ignore them anyways. That's a problem. But that, but that's that's, a very that's not a problem. technical issue. That's a cultural issue, and that is something that you and I and Tom and others have been trying to to re-educate. Well, folks. given the number of high-profile breaches that have been happening, with the latest one being with Jeep, you know, it behooves the sea levels to sit down and make monetary decisions about bonuses and so forth based on breaches. In other words, if you suffer a breach because you didn't do the right thing, you suffer painfully. And next time you're going to listen to the security guy. Pro because... Proving that that is the reason why it went. I mean, at the end of the day, if it's a zero day, no one can code against a zero day. Right. Well, and the thing is, is that I agree with you to a certain extent. But if you don't even have the tools in place, you didn't even listen to anybody, yeah, zero day is going to happen. Yeah, true. When if you're doing everything that you think you can do, you're never going to be able to escape a zero day. Well, if you're doing everything you think you can do, such as, oh, doing static code analysis as things are put into Git or, uh, Git or any type of source code repository, that's a good step. But that's a step in the right direction. There's a lot of really good static code ana analyzers. I think the I think the point here is that um, there's there's many layers to this onion. Yes, there is, and it all right. starts with the top. I think actually going to have to start with the top making decisions and saying, you know, we're going to have to pay attention to security. That's it. Well, there's also security need to come down to earth a little bit. Get out of their yeah. ivory tower. Basically, get out of their ivory tower. Understand the realities of how people have to work and the pressure of how these people are out have to work. And instead of putting blockers in, put solutions in. Because nine times out of 10, and this is the case with me that I've dealt with a lot of security guys, it is a case of, no, you can't do that. Okay, how do I do it? That's not my problem, but you can't do that. Right. Well, then that means that's a security guy that's failed. Exactly. Well, He's that's, not... Me putting my non-security head on, that is, I see that practically every single time that I walk into an environment with a security, with a security guy, and he is literally is the man who says no. You never ever see him say, well, that's not quite right. What have you thought about? It's always, you can't do that. The funny that thing shall is... not have any innovation. Exactly. Here's the here's the funny thing is the environments I walk into it's almost the exact opposite. The security guys are actually involved. They're actually making. That's because they're scared uh, of you. <laughs> they're making suggestions. Edward, <laughs> it, this just comes down to you're making better choices of customers than Tom is. Tom <laughs> failed. <laughs> Uh, failed fire. miserably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you do look a bit like Alan Sugar, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, when you, but when you start thinking about it, I mean, if the tools are in place, and the problem is, is how many people know what tools there is. There, there are, I should say. Not many people are looking at it from, okay, I got infrastructure as code. Why don't I put security as code? And that security as code is part of CI, CD implies that every step of the way, as I deploy things, as I deploy the code, I deploy the infrastructure in a container, in a VM, whatever it is, and then I deploy the security that actually does the testing right then and there. And if I do all that, 
the developers are going to be in the world of, okay, it's hardened, and it's secure, and, oh, I need to do X, Y, and Z. Well, I need to go and talk to the security guy and say, hey, I really need to access port 3306 or whatever it is to access this database. You know, that's not getting in the way of de development. That's saying, okay, let's fix the infrastructure security as code to allow that. Mm -hmm. That way, it's when I deploy in the production, it has everything the developer wanted. And that's why I mean by security shouldn't be embedded in the teams. And if they're not, they need to be. But they need to stop worrying about compliance and start worrying about, you know, really securing the environment. Well, I think the security guys have an uphill battle because of the traditional place that they put themselves in, just as Tom said, of being the guys who put the no in innovation, right? Um, it, 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 this is, this is a, a reputation that we all take the mickey out of, right? Everyone throws the security guy under the bus because he's out of touch. He's saying no, he's, um, he, 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 he isn't up on current events. He only just realized we're running virtualization in the data center. We've been there for seven years. Um, well, he didn't so get they, they have a certain it. onus, right? They have a certain onus to, to repair their reputation. And for those that are doing that, more power to them. Um, but on the other hand, the developers can no longer live in their ivory tower and, and just dictate, well, we're just doing this because, well, we got to get it out because the business needs it. That, that is a very short-sighted uh, attitude. We're seeing the uh, we're seeing companies like Jeep um, who are putting out stuff that needed to get to market, and then are turning around and literally destroying a reputation of the business because, and I'm just assuming here, because there probably wasn't as good a security review of that stuff while it was being developed and before it was released? Well, it's not a security. I mean, granted, I, I'm a big fan of code reviews and, and reviews like that, but they tend to be, when you're talking about the scale we're talking about, unless it's a review of the whole environment, all the bits of code, it's useless. Well, when I mean, when I mean review, I mean, you know, Hiring pen testers. Uh, not, it's not just reviewing of the code. Oh no, it's I agree with you. Reviewing of the practices. It's 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 pen testing. It's it's did the security guy bring up any issues during the development? Oh no, we didn't invite him. Oh really? You yeah. know, it's that That's level the of culture that needs to be addressed. That is where the root of the problems are. Like Tom said, there will always be a zero day. I mean, this is code written by humans. It's always going to have imperfections. Totally get that. And we should all embrace that and um, design our environments so that nothing is the single point of failure. And that when things fail, they fail closed. They don't well, you're fail. Still, you're still, I think the whole problem is, is that we, we can talk person problems all along. And, and to be honest, we can do that later. We all know that Security needs to, anybody working on compliance on a security team needs to go to a compliance team, and security needs to work on security, not compliance. Mm -hmm. Form a different team, they should talk, done. That's that's a business decision, it's probably not going to happen, but that's what I would like to see. When we start talking about true security, and we're talking about developers and asking, hey, did you talk to the security team, and the guy says no, well, that should be a big black, a big red X your bonus gets penalized for that. But that's not mm -hmm. going to happen unless management comes down and says, you will work together. End of story. Do it. And here's the process by which you'll follow. If you have to only have the team leaders talk because everybody else hates each other, well, that's what you do. Having worked in a number of very large companies, the top-down approach rarely makes it down to the developer level. No, because the managers block rarely it. Makes it. Rarely makes it down to the sysadmin level either. That's right, because but... the managers block it, saying it's not necessary for their job. 
Well, the, the thing is, is the the man the managers are being. Let's just say, for example, a uh, we we have five levels between the sysadmin and the CEO. The CEO says, "Thou shalt do security, and security needs to be involved." And just like the game of telephone, where you line up a whole bunch of people and yep. you tell one story on one end, and it's completely different on the other, that sort of thing will happen. So down to the sysadmin level is, oh, the CEO said he was concerned about security. Maybe. I think that's what he said. Right? Yeah, we should probably do more about security. Okay. With no clear definition of what security means, right? And so for the sysadmin, he just turns around and he goes, well, maybe I should uh, well, lock my door. Everyone change their passwords. I've done my job. Yeah. Maybe, uh, lock your doors when you leave the office. Right. Well, I think that Which lasts for about a week. Yeah. Well, ignoring all that, because I mean, the personnel issues we're just not going to solve. We can make recommendations, and you and I both know it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what goes in everybody, every C level's pocket, and and that's basically what it boils down to. And that's Generation Y, and I I, I don't agree with it, but that's the way it is. It's reality. It's reality. But when you start talking about a developer saying, hey, it doesn't make it down to the developers, well, the developers should be concerned about it anyways. They're the ones producing product that's getting hacked seriously. And, and I don't want to throw the developers under the bus. I mean, really, we, we, we do this an awful lot. Um, the I know uh, a large number of developers that are, sec are, Security are focus. Um, conscious of what they're writing and they want to write really good, secure code, and they may even have the tools and stuff, but what they may also be under is a timeline to get something out the door. And when you're under the crunch, security always seems to roll its way down to you the know, bottom of the list. No, this just sounds like Morton Thayer call all over again. That's a perfect, perfect uh, legitimate case. I mean, engineering said, hey, we need to get this out. Business said, we need to get this out. Engineering said, okay, but we're not ready. One engineer basically spoke up and got fired for speaking up and saying, hey, there's a disastrous problem here. And for those that aren't familiar, Morton Thiokol were the, the manufacturers of the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle that blew up. And Morton Thiokol no longer exists. Well, they're now... now um, um, somebody ATK. else. Yeah, there's somebody else because the name got so damaged. Yes. That they had to rebrand and actually they sold off a huge number. But this is what I mean. We're we're hitting that again. If if we do this, we go through this anymore. The companies that have gotten breached, they're pretty serious problems. They're going to have to go through the whole. They're. they're their reputation is damaged, and it's in the hands of the developers and in the hands of these people saying, hey, I need it yesterday. Okay, here it is. Here it is. It's today, but you know what? We were a day late. Yeah, uh, well, you know, it, the, those, those situations are usually someone overriding, you know, the engineer who speaks up or the security guy who speaks up or, uh, or the manager who speaks up. At some point, it no longer becomes a security issue. It becomes a business risk management decision. Yeah, we saw this exactly in the Phoenix project. Yes. Right? Yep. Where it, it, it at some point, it rises up the, the management chain and someone says, looks at, listens to, you know, through the telephone line, through the multiple layers, and then turns around and says, well, We'll have to just fix that in the next update. Make sure you get it fixed in the next update. The next update six months later. And, and then it's another six months after that before the customer installs it. <laughs> if they do it all, I mean, look right. at so some of the, the products have the new the updates. Now the customer is sitting there with something that has a zero day or a, a vulnerability for almost a year. And they don't even know because they were right. never told. Well, who's going to say? If you say you've got a zero day in it, you're never going to sell it. Right. Oh, well, yeah, you can have this wonderful piece of software. However, said never said any salesman ever. It's not about sales. <laughs> I mean, it's a... 
I don't think it's really about that. It's, it's information it's is, about is king. return on in your investment. At the end of the day, if you have long delivery cycles with large periods between updates, you have a lot of capital invested in that environment that your that your board wants to get back. So they want to push that thing out as soon as possible. People from a development point of view, they need to get away from talk, thinking features. I know everyone be, hates Adobe because every five minutes they're asking to update their Adobe environment. But that's the reality of what continuous development and, and in, continuous integration and development yes. means. Yeah. You are going to be constantly told you're having an update. Right. Windows Which, 10 is a perfect example of that. Windows exactly. 10 will not have, oh, you should run Windows Update. Windows 10 will be pulling down those updates and installing them unless you tell it no. And even yeah. then, it may be difficult to do that. And that is, the, that is as Tom says, the reality of uh, this agile-based continuous improvement cycle. And, you know, like one of the slides I had up in my fact versus fiction um, session at VMworld last year showed uh, an image of a ESX server that had been up for 1,400 days. That's not a badge. Okay. That's not a badge of pride. That's a right. badge of stupidity. Yeah. And, and, and I said, if you're doing it this way, you're doing it wrong. You know, if, if, you, if your environment is so screwed up that you can't, that every single security update has to be a major all hands on deck thing. You know, I can't help you. Well, and this and that is goes why back you need, again to people. And this is, well, it actually goes back to tools, I think, because. No, it goes, it goes to people because nine times out of 10, when I talk to customers, it's almost always a people and process issue rather than a technical issue. We're not going to install that until we run it through our test environment because we don't want it to break production. And my response is production may be in a state where you really want to push that sort of update. Well, and that's what I mean. I, that's what I'm talking about. I think that this actually can, the tools exist to solve that problem. And that's, the, the, I'm not sure many people are using those tools. Every time I do it, I don't see that. And that, I just don't see the tools being used. For example, I do not see people doing security as code. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Very few people that I know of are doing that. It's, I mean, Rich Mogul and his gang at Securosis and a few others really are pushing this. And so am I. And the thing is, is that if you're going to be doing any type of DevOps movement or agile development, security has to be part of it. That's, that's a personnel decision. But at the same time, if I can put the right tools in place, a lot of that may be alleviated automatically. If I can automate, for example, the OpenSSL updates, so the next time you deploy your container in development, it has the latest OpenSSL, you know, that's a big plus. Because you're going to fix those problems almost immediately if there's any that come up. And if none come up, guess what? It gets pushed all the way out to production, and it, gets, it has the latest OpenSSL. So if we're not doing that up front as part of what developers are using on a day-to-day -day basis from a technological perspective, even if it's like the latest .NET update for whatever they're doing on Windows, that is to fix something, they need to do that. It needs to be part of that. I'm starting a sprint. I'm getting everything new. Okay. It contains all these latest security bells and whistles because it's got patched. You know, it may be three days after you just deployed. And I think that's the only way to really do this because unless the developers are running it, what's going to go out in production? And by the way, if it gets patched during production, it gets patched during production. You just redeploy the, the production containers. Done. That one comment you made there, developers are running it scared the living bejeebas out of every single operations guy in the world. It's not about that. It's about, you know what, if you're going to test something, it's better off testing in 12 inches to the foot, which means you start with development, and then you go into testing, then you go into QA, and then you get into production. 
that method has not changed with Agile. Testing and QA no, have just been compressed. I agree. But from, from an operations point of view, development are like a bunch of chaotic cats chasing after a, a little red dot. <laughs> and from an op developer's point of view, operations folks are the folks that are trying to like take all the red dots and put them together in a nice thin beam. Yeah, because we, they like calm. But I never said anything about not being calm. If I do security as code as part of this, which I involve security testing as part of my test cycle automatically on deployment, and if it doesn't pass, it doesn't go out, that's a big step in the right direction too. That denotes that you need at least three separate teams. No. Which, is, which it, it does. You need your development people who are doing the developers. You need the QA and testers that are, are code aware but don't mess with code. And then you need your operations who take it from the QA people. And there needs to be three separate processes in that environment because they only if you're doing entities. waterfall. If you're waterfall, even, you've got those. If you're not, if you're doing not even agile, if, not even if you're doing waterfall, scrum agile will not work in a productionized environment where you need stability. I actually think it will because I've seen it work. I've got to disagree with you. But if you don't have the process and the tools in place to test all this stuff, it makes no difference where you are. At scale, it won't work. You know, delivery cycles, yeah, fantastic. Bring them, make them smaller. But to make them smaller, you need to make the code that you're putting in smaller. Yeah, but you need to also test everything the way you would in production. And that also means, you know, if you're running a web app, bring in the Simeon army. Well, that doesn't matter. That, that will never happen because that costs money. Simeon Army is free. You know, and when you when you start to get when you start constraining, the first thing to get thrown out of that window is Q and A and test. Actually, it's the second thing to get thrown out the window. The first thing to get thrown out the window is security. Well, but I'm saying is if it's part of the code of deployment into product into dev, part of the de plan of deployment into production or an, into te the te whatever test cycle there is, when you start doing that as part of code, part of deployment, hmm. everybody gets the same that exact thing. It needs to be done, and you can actually throw into their security testing as part of all that. Oh, putting it into Git, need to do a build. Build needs security testing before it gets accepted. It needs to be automated. If we don't automate it, it won't scale at all. There's not enough man hours out there to do everything we need to do. Agreed. Mike's just sitting back saying, we've heard all this before. Yeah, that and I'm thinking of the, the uh, little red ra uh, laser dots and thinking, I have a 75 pound German shepherd that acts just like a cat when it comes to a laser. <laughs> and that is hilarity. That needs video in. Um, need video. Yeah, I think I've done it before, but I'll, I'll see if I can do it again. You, you, you might make millions off a YouTube video for that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a cat video after all. Rex, Rex the, fe the feline canine. Yeah, every time I, I have a laser pointer in, in a closet, and every time I open the closet, he is running over to the closet waiting for the laser pointer to come up. He's a strange dog. Yes. Yes. Well. So, so, I mean, can we put the tools in place? Yes, I agree. The tools exist. Can we get people to use the tools? That's a different story, and that actually yeah. has to be tied to bonuses, has to be tied to job descriptions, has to be tied all the way up and down the stack. It has to be embraced by management. It has to be up embraced and down the stack. Embraced by management at all levels. It's not about everybody saying, "Well, you got to understand how the how the how much pressure the developers are under." It's like, okay, that's great. We all understand that, but you need to understand how much pressure the security folks are under too. You know what? That whole understanding—that's just—that's just people. Yep. I don't need to understand the fact that you're under a lot of pressure to do my job. 
And if my job is to code securely, I better do that. Right? And if I can't do it, I need the tools to help me do it. Or I need the people to help me do it. And if I or don't both. get the help, or both, if I don't get the help, I cannot do my job. Yep. And if that's in my job description, which it should be in everybody, every developer's job description, to be honest, then there's no need for me to concentrate on it. I mean, that's where it boils down to. Maybe the job descriptions need to be rewritten. Start there. And with that, the horse is now dead. <laughs> but but I just want to say one more thing, is that if you don't have the tools in place now, get them. That's a good step in the right direction. And if you don't have the processes in place, explore them. Yes. I think the processes are probably a lot more important than the tools at the first place because open up the processes, get people talking, get people actually working together you'll find that a lot of the tools may become surplus to requirements. Possibly. Throwing, throwing, throwing tools in and telling people to use them. Actually, I'm saying throw the tools in and you don't know they're being used. They're just being used. For so example, you tie... To actually use to know what the tools are saying. That's, I mean, if I'm doing a security tool that does a static code analysis, for example, that's the security team's requirement to understand that, or someone in development's requirement to understand what that bug report is. Because what's going to happen is I'm going to say, okay, I did my analysis, and now I opened up these 10 new bug reports into the existing ticketing system. Okay? That's all it needs to do. So now it's something recorded for development to work on. Oh, you got to fix this, 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 and this. It still gets put in the repository, but you now now have recorded that. And you can, if it's egregious enough, you can say, "I'm sorry, that was rejected." You can't put that code in because you need to absolutely fix this problem. That's a sev one type of thing, and it was rejected. You get doing that's a tool issue. Oh, I need help for that. They go off and get help, but unless the tool is doing that, because I can't scale up to 100,000 developers. That's the problem. It's a scale issue. If I have a million lines of code, no one's going to go through a million lines of code by hand. Okay? Just not going to happen. It may have happened previously. We just don't have the time to do it. So I got a tool to help me do at least code analysis. And then I put in a tool that does, hey, I did a build. Let me, it's part of that build. It automatically does, boots up a, a testing environment throws the code in there, throws a bunch of known security tests against it. It fails any one of those, the build gets rejected. Or it gets another, hey, you got this minor problem, let me go ahead and open you up to yet another bug report. If I do that at every level of the way, as part of security as code, as infrastructure as code, as just the code, the process is responding to bug reports like normal. Nothing's changed there. I'm not affecting your process any. I'm putting in tools to augment your existing co your existing way of doing deployments, way of doing builds, way of doing um, um, submits for the code repository. At every step of the way, I can put a security issue, a security check along the way, along the path. And once I do that, you know, I've changed it, and the process does, should not change. File bug reports. Look at the bug, current set of bug reports. What am I going to fix? Fix them. Go to the next set and so forth. It just reminds me of that developer's job. One little bug fixed, one little bug fixed, 20 more bugs to go. <laughs> or 24 <laughs> new bugs to go. 24 new bugs to go, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we know what the main deadly sins of software, uh, software programming are today. Those are well documented, actually. There is checkers like Black Duck and a few others that can do that. And, you know, but if you don't tie in the tools, I mean, I'm a big fan of incremental changes. I'm a big fan of, hey, keep your process the same. Let's, let's make the tools fit the process. If I have to change the process that says, hey, human, you need to do X, Y, and Z as well as A, B, C. You know, human is going to say, I did A, B, C, but I didn't have time to do X, Y, and Z. Why do I want the human involved to do that? 
when I don't have to have them involved. I can just do it automatically. And I'm talking scale. This is not a small shop I'm talking about. I've got a thousand developers. Maybe five of those understand security, if you're lucky. Also depends on where your code's being written as well. I mean, if your code's being written offshore because it's cheaper. You know, if I put these tools in, I now at least know there's bugs and that they need to be addressed. And for containers, that may be the best way to do it. But I think that I just get worried about containers because at the end of the day, containers have been around for as long, if not longer, than virtualization. I know containers have been around since 1970. The yeah. first container was a Chirrut jail. It's all Docker is, anyways. Oh yeah, exactly. This Solaris zones running on Linux. Something like so, that, yeah. So you know, all this stuff should already be here. Well, the OS has to be hardened, hence why they're using CoreOS and Atom as the container host. Each container has a set of libraries that need to be hardened with their config. Each, and, But that security is code. It should be done automatically. It should be the security team should be writing that code. That security is code. It should be saying you need this version with this config. Oh, I need to change the config because of a yet another SSL bug. It should just happen. I, I'm sorry, I, you guys may think it's people in process, but I actually think the tools may not, can be implemented without changing process. Uh, Got to disagree with you there. That's, I, that's, putting, that's putting an awful lot of relying on yeah. tools and no onus on people and oh i think the onus while, should while, be on the people while too can, while you can while, while there's always a better idiot that will come along to break your idiot proof application but if you think about how we're, we're what things are happening this may not be the worst thing to do so we're really more of unintended consequences yep i have to get moving well, anyways, guys, thank you for joining me on the Virtualization and Cloud Security podcast. Check out um, Ixia's, and actually, we'll see everybody at VMworld. So, everybody, check out the new deliveries at VM. Um, Mike's talks at VMworld should be great. We'll talk more about that in future podcasts. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Thanks.